Take your Bibles with me today and turn to Matthew chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6. So, uh, how many of you ever heard of the flying Walindas? Anybody ever heard of the flying Walindas? The, the Walinda family is a, is a family that was involved and has been involved in circus since dating back to the 1700s all the way back in Europe. And when they came to the United States uh, about 100 years ago or something like that, they concentrated specifically on, uh, on the high wire walk act. They are known as aerialists the flying Walindas, and they actually are very famous, and we can go to the next slide, they're famous for what they call their seven-man pyramid. I can't even imagine this. You can see uh, four guys on the bottom, and then two guys on top of them, and then I'm not sure if that's a man or a lady, on a chair on top of them. Now, that would be hard to do on the ground, but they are doing that on a very thin wire, a hundred or so feet up in the air. I watch that and I think, oh my word, I can't imagine the concentration that it would take to walk on such a thin wire. I try to walk just on this straight line right here, right now, and I feel a little wobbly. I haven't been drinking anything, but I feel a little wobbly and a little shaky this morning. So I can't imagine doing that on a high wire. Well, in March 1978, while performing an exhibition in San Juan, Puerto Rico, Carl Walinda, who at that time was the patriarch of the family, fell to his death. You maybe remember that. This man who had walked on the high wire hundreds and thousands of times, it was his life. Obviously, he had never made that mistake before. On that day, he fell to his death. Carl Walinda's wife made this statement about that day. She said, For the first time since I have known him that day, Carl was more focused on falling than he was walking on the tightrope. What happened to Carl Willinda that day? He very simply lost focus. And it's dangerous to lose focus on the ground. It's even more dangerous to lose focus when you're 100 plus feet in the air. To lose focus is is extremely dangerous. Now, I say all of that to say this because I believe that there are many believers today. I believe there are many people who identify themselves as followers of Jesus Christ who have lost focus. They've taken their eyes off of Jesus and then place their eyes on something else. Now, 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 they still identify themselves as believers, and I might be talking to you today. You, you, you still identify yourself as a follower of Jesus Christ, yet quite frankly, you're distracted. And, and your mind, your heart, your eyes, your passion, your goals is focused on something other than Jesus. That's what Jesus addresses in the passage of Scripture that we're looking at today. And so, if you're following along in your Bible or on your iPhone, your iPad, we're in Matthew chapter 9, beginning in verse 19. We'll put it up on the screen. Uh, Many of you are familiar with these verses, and, and please don't tune these verses out just because you've read them many times before or just because you think you know what they're saying. Allow the Holy Spirit of God to speak to you as He's spoken to me all week long. Jesus says this, don't lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. Notice this verse, if you underline in your Bibles, this is a great verse to underline For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. In other words, you and I follow after. We focus on what is most important to us. Verse 22, the eye is the lamp of the body. So if your eye is healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light in you is darkness, how great is that darkness. No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, 
or else he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. As a matter of fact, you cannot serve God and anything else. Would you bow your head and your heart with me today? Would you pause right where you are and pray just a simple prayer today? Simply say this, God, speak to my heart. Help me to listen to the Holy Spirit. If there's a treasure in my life that I value more than Jesus, indicate that to me today. If there's a master that I am serving who is not Jesus, point that out to me today. Father, I pray today that the Holy Spirit of God would do what we cannot do. Help us to understand these verses. Help us to apply them to our lives. May Jesus be the center of our lives. May Jesus truly be the most important person, the most important thing, the most important possession, the only Lord and Master that we serve. Help us to hear from you today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. John Ortberg, who is a uh, famous preacher today, makes this statement. He says, for most of us, the great danger is not that we will renounce our faith. It is that we will become so distracted, so rushed, so preoccupied that we will settle for a mediocre version of it. We will just skim our lives instead of actually living them. If you ever read the book by C.S. Lewis, Screwtape Letters, in which, uh, you know, the devil and a demon is, is plotting, they're plotting how to distract believers, and all these demons are saying, well, you know what, let's, let's uh, cause them to renounce their faith, let's cause them to renounce Jesus, and uh, Screwtape simply says, no, I got the best plan, they're not going to renounce Jesus, let's simply distract them. Let, let's cause them to take their eyes off of Jesus and to focus on something else. Obviously, that's a novel. If you haven't read it, I would encourage you to read it. But that is the great danger of believers today. And so the question for me today that I've had to ask myself this week, and the question for you simply is this, on whom are we focused? Who? Who is the most important person? What is the most important thing in our lives? Is it possible that I've taken my eyes off Jesus? Is it possible that I am distracted by the things of this life? So today we want to ask three simple questions. There are introspective questions that, that I want you to ask yourself. The questions simply are this, where is your treasure? How is your vision? And who are you serving? Ask those questions along with me today. So the first question is this, where is your treasure? If you'll notice in verses 19 and 20, Jesus talks about treasure. He actually gives a negative command, and then he gives a positive command. He says, do not lay up treasures for yourselves on earth. And then in verse 20, he says, but do lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven. It's interesting, uh, if you love grammar and everything, the word lay up and the word treasures are actually the exact same Greek word. It's the word from which we get our word thesaurus, which literally a thesaurus is a treasury of words. So here's literally what Jesus is saying. He's saying, do not treasure up treasures for yourselves. The, the term has the idea of stacking up or laying horizontally. If I had some bricks here today, I could take these bricks and I could begin stacking them up. I could begin piling them up. Or if I had, you know, a, a bunch of quarters on the table and I began stacking those quarters up in neat little piles. That's the idea that Jesus is conveying in the passage. It has the idea of stockpiling. It has the idea of hoarding. Now, now here's the message that Jesus is trying to communicate if you're following along in your notes. Jesus is simply saying this. You and I are commanded not to accumulate treasures on earth, 
but rather to store up treasures in heaven. Very simple, all right, the concept. We're commanded not to accumulate treasures on earth, but rather we are commanded to store up those treasures in heaven. Let's pause for a second because you're thinking the same thing I'm thinking. That kind of goes a little bit against the American mindset, does it not? Uh, We are taught, we are encouraged to get as much as possible. Man, you got to put it away. Yeah, you got to stock it away. You got to save for a rainy day. And, and I don't believe the Bible teaches that we shouldn't do that. The book of Proverbs talks about the importance of saving. And, and later next year, we're going to be talking about the correct use of finances and the importance of saving and, and being prepared. But the idea is not not being prepared, it's the idea of hoarding, stockpiling more than we need. Notice the key word he says this. Do not lay up for yourselves. You might want to underline the word yourselves in the passage. Now let me, I've had to ask myself this question this week. Why wouldn't Jesus want us to accumulate treasures on earth? Well, I mean, that's basically what he's saying. Why wouldn't he want us to do that? Well, two reasons that I see in the passage. The first is this. Earthly treasures are easily lost. That's what Jesus is saying. Earthly treasures are easily lost. He mentioned several ways in the passage that you and I can easily lose that which we save and store up here on the earth. He says, first of all, moths and rust corrupt what we store. Now, now this, this is understood maybe a little bit more in New Testament times than in our day and age because in New Testament times, wealth was measured in three ways different than today. In New Testament times, wealth was measured by how much food you had stored up, which makes sense. It was measured by how many gold coins you had stored up. That makes sense. But the third way that wealth was mentioned was in the amount of clothes that you had. All right, now remember, there wasn't Walmart back then. There wasn't Target. You couldn't go buy a shirt for $7.99 back then. All right, people clothes were very expensive. And not only were clothes expensive, but people had the habit of investing in their clothes. You say, well, Brian, I do the same thing. You ought to see my closet. Or maybe, guys, you're saying you ought to see my wife's closet. We do the exact same thing at our house. What was even different in the New Testament because they would sew gold into their clothes. Remember, there were no banks. There was no stock markets. There was nothing to invest in, and so they would invest in their clothes by sewing gold into their clothes. Now, I know you and I value our clothes today. Could you imagine how much we would value our clothes if there there literally was gold sewn in those clothes? And yet what happened in New Testament times is today, moths would get in and eat away at that investment. Could you imagine going into your closet and your gold leaf jacket had been eaten by moths. I mean, that would be somewhat discouraging, would it not? Here's what Jesus is saying. doesn't matter how you invest. Your investment here on earth can be easily lost. It doesn't matter how wise of investor you are. It doesn't matter how much you have your money protected. You and I have no idea what's going to happen to the stock market. It's easy for us to lose what we have. Hey, there's nothing more discouraging than to see your investment eaten up, rusted away, or to break apart. That's what Jesus is saying. There's a second thing. He said, thieves steal. Now, we certainly understand that, but once again, in New Testament times, they didn't have banks, so people would bury their wealth. They would bury their wealth in their yard or they would bury their wealth. Many of the houses were, were dirt, clay-made houses, and so they would bury their wealth in the walls of their house. Seems like a, a pretty secure place to, uh, to uh, store your wealth. And yet, what would happen? Thieves would come in, and the text says thieves would break in. The, the word that is literally used there means that they would dig through. Can you imagine going to a family's house for a reunion and coming home and looking at your house and your yard is dug up 
and people have literally dug through the walls of your house looking for your treasure. That's what Jesus is saying. He says, listen, earthly treasures can easily be lost. I'm sure all of us have gone through a period of time where we've had something stolen or we have lost a major investment, or we put a lot of money into a car, and that car was totaled. We could list a variety of reasons. Jesus says, man, be careful how much you're accumulating here. Why? Because earthly treasures are easily lost. Now, once again, he's not telling us to not prepare for a rainy day. He's not telling us to give everything away. He is preaching against hoarding. He's preaching against holding on to more than we need. There's a second truth that he makes, though. The second truth is this. Heavenly treasures, though, are eternally protected. Just as earthly treasures are easily lost, Jesus says heavenly treasures are eternally protected. He says, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where, where there are no moths. By the way, hey, Great theological truth, no moths in heaven. I'm not sure whether you realize that or not. No rust in heaven, all right? So here's what he said. No thieves in heaven, by the way. He's saying, listen, invest in that which is eternal, that which is eternally protected. Here's the idea. What you and I forward to heaven cannot be lost. What you and I forward to heaven cannot be squandered. What you and I forward to heaven cannot be stolen. It is an eternal investment. Let's get practical today. Because you sit back and say, okay, Brian, I get that. But, but how in the world do I do that? You know, when I talk to my stockbroker and he lists all the different stocks that I can invest in, heaven is not one of them, right? Um, there, there's no b- branch of Heaven's Bank here in South Florida that I know of, even though some bankers would insist that their bank is as close to heaven as you can possibly get. When you invest in it, it's not going to heaven. So how can you and I store up treasures in heaven? Two ways. They're not in your notes, but there's two ways, and I want you to catch this. The first is this. By sacrificial giving. By sacrificial giving. See, I want you to know, every time, every time, every time you and I give to our church, every time we give to a missionary, every time we we sponsor a needy child, every time we help a needy family, Every time we invest what God has given us for the benefit of his cause, his work, to help someone else, guess what we're doing? We are sending our investment ahead of us to heaven. You see, this morning, in a very real sense, whatever you gave in the offering plate, you could have picked up the phone and called heaven and said, I just want you to know I just made an investment. It's on its way up there. That's what Jesus says. Listen, make sure that you are investing not just in this life, but make sure that you are investing eternally. We do that by our sacrificial giving. We do that by realizing that what God has given to us is a blessing, and we have the privilege and the responsibility of giving it back to others. Let me just pause for a second and say, if you're not sponsoring a child in Burkina Faso, you should. Isn't that right, Amy? What a great investment in your money to be able to do that. And we're going to be talking about that in the next few weeks. There's another way that you invest in heaven. You invest in heaven by your compassionate serving. By your compassionate serving. You see, every time you use your time, every time you use your talents to serve others, You are sending an investment ahead of you to heaven. And I can mention so many people in our ministry. uh, Yesterday, I I watch every Saturday from a distance our food pantry team out there sweating like crazy. You say, Brian, why do you watch from a distance? Because it's air conditioned in here and it's hot out there. And I can stand in the door right out there and thank God for those workers that are out there working. And they come in periodically to just experience the air conditioning and, and, get, and get, you know, just a, a little bit of cool air and some cold water to drink. You know what they do every single Saturday? They're sending an investment ahead to heaven. 
Whenever you serve in a ministry, you're sending an investment to head to heaven. Whenever you minister to that neighbor or you help someone in your community, you are sending an investment to head to heaven. Let me ask you this morning, and only you know the answer to this, where are you heavily invested? Are you most heavily invested here on the earth, or are you frequently sending money to heaven? I've told this story before. In between um, our, our junior and senior year of college, Vicki and I were planning on getting married. And so I, during that summer, man, I worked, I think I worked three jobs that summer. I had a future wife that I had to take care of. And, and uh, that summer I made $1,000. Now, it doesn't sound like a ton of money today, but 1979, that was a lot of money. At least it was for this, you know, 20-year-old kid. I made $1,000. And so my dad said, now, Brian, we have to invest that money. I said, okay. So we went to a broker. I'm this 20-year-old kid, never been to a broker before. We wanted to invest that money because if we didn't invest it, I would have spent it all year long. And so, so we sat down with this broker and we, we decided what we were going to invest it in. And he said, now, Brian, he said, there's several banks we can put that money in, whatever it was. I don't remember. He said, there's a bank in this city. There's a bank in this city. And then he said, and, and, and this investment has a branch in Beverly Hills, California. I said, that's where I want my money. I want my money in Beverly Hills. And so all year long, I was telling people, yeah, I have $1,000 invested in a bank in Beverly Hills, California. (laughs) I think I made a a whopping 25 bucks on my investment that year or something like that. All right? Listen, you and I can choose. You can choose where you are going to invest your time, talents, and resources. Jesus says, man, don't accumulate here on the earth. Send your investments ahead of you to heaven. There's a second truth that we pull from this, and I know I'm getting a little personal today, but um, Scripture does that. The second is this. You and I are reminded that the way we spend our money reflects the condition of our hearts. Listen, that's what Jesus says, verse 21. Where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Jesus is saying what is truly valuable to you is demonstrated by the way that you spend your money. You see, I could look at your checkbook, you could look at my checkbook, and we could make the determination what is important to us. Why is that? We invest in that which is important to us. Let me make a couple of statements. I want to clarify some things, and they're in your notes. The first is this. Jesus never magnifies poverty, nor does he criticize the legitimate use and gain of wealth. All right, that's not what Jesus is saying in the passage. There's nothing saintly about being poor, and there's nothing sinful about being rich. That's not what Jesus is talking about. Some people today teach a form of theology that's called poverty theology, which teaches that we should give up every single thing that we have and live as poor, demonstrate asceticism, and live as poor as we possibly can. I don't believe that's what Jesus is teaching in scripture. He's not telling us that we have to sell everything. You say, well, Brian, isn't that what he told the rich young ruler? Yeah, but what he was doing with the rich young ruler is he was trying to figure out what was important to the rich young ruler. And he was asking the rich young ruler, are you willing to give up everything if that's what was necessary to follow Jesus Christ? Nowhere in the Bible does it say that the poor are going to heaven because they're poor and that the rich are going to hell because they are rich. Right, but the Bible doesn't teach poverty theology. I would also say that the Bible doesn't teach prosperity theology, which is the other end of that. The Bible doesn't teach that God wants you to be rich. And if you follow Jesus Christ, then wealth is going to follow you. The New Testament doesn't teach that. Jesus wasn't that way. Uh, Jesus said this, foxes have olds and the birds of air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. Jesus was buried in a borrowed tomb. When he rode into Jerusalem, he had to go in on a borrowed donkey. Jesus was not extremely wealthy. So anybody that tells you Jesus was wealthy and God wants you to be wealthy is distorting Scripture. That's not what Scripture says. Here's what God says. God says, I expect you to wisely 
use that which I have given you. If it's a little, I expect you to wisely use it. If it's a lot, I expect you to wisely use it. Not only to enjoy life, and we are to enjoy life, but for his honor and for his glory. You might sit back and say, well, man, Brian, I wish God would give me a little bit more to use to enjoy life and for his kingdom. Did you ever think of this? Maybe you haven't been faithful with a little bit that he's given you. Maybe if I would be a little bit more faithful in the little that God's given me, maybe God would trust me with just a little bit more. And so Jesus doesn't magnify poverty, and he doesn't criticize the legitimate use of wealth. Here's the second statement I made that's important to flesh out. The second is this. It's not wrong to possess things, but it is wrong for things to possess you. Let me say that again. It's not wrong to possess things, but it is wrong for things to possess you. What do I mean by that? Think about this for just a second. Anything that you have, or that you do that affects your relationship with Jesus Christ controls you. Let that sink in for just a second. Anything that you have, anything that you do that affects, negatively affects your relationship with Jesus Christ has too much control over You say, well, Brian, give us a list. What are you talking about? Nah, I'm not going to give a list. Rather than listing a bunch of things that would step on many people's toes, let me just ask you a few questions today. Let me ask you a few questions, and you honestly answer these questions in your mind and heart today. What keeps you from spending time, adequate more time, in God's Word and in prayer? You might sit back and say, oh, man, Brian, if I just had time, I'd read my Bible every day. Or if I just had time, man, I would really dedicate that time to prayer. Really? How many hours do you have in a day? 24? All right. I think you have the same amount. We what? We spend our time doing other things. We spend our time doing things that we enjoy, that are important to us, and, and, and we Fritter time away. Is that a word? I'm not sure whether that word. We waste time away. We waste time doing things that are important to us that take away from our time with God. What do we demonstrate? We demonstrate what is truly important to us. We demonstrate what we treasure. Hey, here's the second question. What is it that keeps you from faithfully worshiping with your faith family. What is it? Man, Brian, we just got so much going on. Hey, you know what? I'm just asking a question. Sometimes we allow the things of this life to distract us from what is really important. And by the way, we, we teach our kids what's important. We say this is important, but we demonstrate it with our actions. What is, it, what is it that keeps you from serving in a ministry? What is it that keeps you from using your, your time and your talents to serve the Lord? See, see here's what I'm saying today. It, 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 if your heart is chasing after anything other than God, that thing possesses you. It has become a treasure that is taking your heart away from God. So the first question is this, what is it that you treasure? There's a second question that we find indicated in the passage. The second question is this, how is your vision? In verses 22 and and 23, Jesus uses some words that seemingly don't fit. I mean, he he says, where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. And then all of a sudden he talks about the eye, and the eye is the lamp of the body, and and, uh, all of that kind of stuff. And so many people sit back and say, man, I have no idea what Jesus is saying. Here's what Jesus is saying. First of all, he's saying that the eye is the physical pathway through which light enters the body. All right? So do me a favor. Everybody... Close your eyes. Close your eyes. 
So what happened when you close your eyes? You can't see, right? It's gone from light to darkness. Okay, you can open your eyes now, all right? If if you fell asleep, wake up, wake up, wake up, (laughs) all right? So what happens? The eyes are the biological pathway through which light enters your body. So Jesus is using that as an illustration. He's saying, likewise, just as the eye is the physical pathway through which light enters your body, likewise, the eye is the spiritual filter through which desires flow to the mind and to the heart. The eye is the spiritual filter through which desires flow to the mind and to the heart. You see, there is a direct connection between what you see and what you want. Let let me illustrate it today. Let me show you a a couple of pictures today. All right, first picture. I'm not a dog lover, and that makes my heart patter just a little bit, right? All right, you see that, and you sit back and think, oh, we need a little puppy, Somebody probably in this congregation is going to go to the pet store because we put that picture up there today, all right? You see it, and you what? You want it. Look at that picture. What does that make you want? Vacation. Oh, my word. I just want to sit on a chair on a beach and do absolutely nothing. You see that. You might see other people's vacation pictures, and you say what? I want that, all right? Here's a third one. Oh, my word. Yeah, if Brian would only shut up, we could go get one of those right now, right? You see that, and you want it. Listen, advertisers get it. Listen, they make pictures of their hamburgers, and by the way, the pictures of their hamburgers are better than their hamburgers really are, right? They're bigger, they're all of that. Why do they do that? What are they trying to do? They know they can catch you with your eyes. That's what Jesus is saying. The eye is not only the physical pathway through which light enters the body, light is the, or excuse me, your eyes are the spiritual filter through which desires flow to your mind and your heart. Here's what I'm saying. Your mind and heart desire what your eyes see. Is that true? Lamentations chapter 3 and verse 51. King James says it this way, my eye affects my heart. You say, man, Brian, I didn't know there was a biological uh, connection between the eye and the heart. There is a connection. The ESV says, this way my eyes cause me grief. Why is that? Because I see something I cannot have and I desire it. David realized this in Psalm 101 and verse 3 when he said this, I will set or I will not set before my eyes anything that is worthless. Let me fill in your outline. An eye that is focused on earthly things is dark and diseased. That's what Jesus is saying. This eye that is focused on earthly things, why? It's allowing darkness. And, And the word that's actually used in the text has the idea of disease. It has the idea of a chronic disease which can kill you. So an eye that is focused not on heavenly things, but an eye that is focused on earthly things, Jesus says is dark and diseased. He says, secondly, that an eye that is focused on heavenly things, though, is light and it's healthy. That's what those verses are saying. I know they're a little difficult to understand, but Jesus is saying, whatever you are focused on, if, you're, if you are focused on things of this earth, look out because your mind, your heart is filled with darkness. But if your mind and your heart and your eyes are focused towards heavenly things, man, you are healthy. Uh, a few years ago, I preached a message on temptation and I used this hat. And if you remember this. And, and the idea being that we are We are so easily distracted, are we not? I mean, even though we want to serve God, it doesn't matter which way we turn. We have temptations all around us. I have this in my office, and everybody comes in my office and says, Pastor Brown, I just want to know, how come there's a Bud Light can in your office? As if I'm, you know, in the afternoon, I I just need a little bit there. You know what? It's so easy for us to what? It's so easy for us to get distracted by the things of this world. Does it happen to you? It happens to me. 
Uh, that's why Paul says in Colossians chapter 3, verses 1 and 2, if you have been raised with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things that are above, not on things that are on the earth. You see, what distracts you? It doesn't even have to be sinful things. Good things can distract you. Good things can take your eyes off of Jesus. Many people today put their family before God. Listen, I understand the importance of family, but listen, if you're putting your family before God, your family is an idol in your life. Jesus said, he who doesn't hate mother, father, brother, sister, wife, son for my sake cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Obviously, he's not telling us to hate our families, but what is he telling us? Nobody ought to be more important in your life than God. Listen, often families, people put their families before God. Many people put enjoyment before God. Many people put their car, their boat, their house whatever it is, before God. Here's what Jesus is saying. Don't be distracted. Where your heart is or where your treasure is, that's where your heart will be. And our enemy is so astute, he will do everything possible to distract us. So the first question is this, where is your treasure? The second question is this, how is your vision? And the third question we ask in the passage is this, who are you serving? Verse 24 says, no one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, else he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. You cannot serve God and something else. The word master that's used here is the word from which we get our word, Lord. Same word. Here's what he's saying. You cannot have two lords in your life. You cannot, I cannot have two masters in my life. By definition, a, uh, a, a, a master, a, a slave owner during New Testament times had total control over that slave. For a slave, there was no such thing as partial or a part-time obligation to his or her master. That individual owed full-time allegiance, full-time service to a full-time manager. I'm afraid at times God is our part-time Lord. He's our Lord on Sunday and maybe one or two other days of the week. Or maybe he's our Lord from Monday to Friday and the weekend's ours. And he's not Lord then. Jesus says, you cannot serve two masters. Here's what he means. You cannot be in two armies at the exact same time. Could you imagine if someone from our army or our Marines said, okay, I want to be part of the Marines, but you know what? I think I want to be a part of the Russian army at the exact same time. I think I want to work part-time for the U.S. military and part-time for ISIS. We'd sit back and think, you can't do that. That's what? That's traitorous. You, you cannot work for, you cannot serve two armies at the same time. You cannot be a Dolphins fan and a Jets fan at the exact same time. Can I get an amen on that? Somebody told me yesterday I'd preach this message, and they said, well, you can as long as the Jets aren't playing the Dolphins. And I sit back, and I have a theological argument with that, right? <laughs> Listen, you can't, you can't really root for two teams at the exact same time. Hey, you'll get this one. You can't be married to two women at the exact same time. Am I right, ladies? What if your husband came to you and said, listen, I want you to know I love you with all of my heart, but I love somebody else too. You'd say, man, hit the road, Jack, right? <laughs> I, I'm not going to share my love. I'm not going to share my allegiance with somebody else. I want a one woman man. Amen, ladies? Amen. All right. So here, here's what Jesus is saying. Jesus is saying very simply this. It is impossible to effectively and faithfully serve two masters at the same time. Many people are trying to do that in their relationship with the Lord. 
They claim to be ardent followers of Jesus Christ, but their actions show that they're loyal to someone else or they're loyal to something else. Jesus is not interested in shared loyalty. Jesus is not looking for part-time disciples. Jesus is looking for full-time disciples. You cannot worship earthly things and Jesus at the same time. Let me give you an illustration and I'm done. Jesus died on the cross, rose, we know the whole story. We know that Peter had denied the Lord before his crucifixion. As a result of Peter's denial, um, Peter felt worthless and rejected. He had failed the Lord. So Peter basically leaves the ministry. Basically, I'm not putting words in Peter's mouth, but Peter thinking, I don't think I'm cut out for this disciple thing. I'm, I'm better being a fisherman, a fisher of fish rather than a fisher of men. So in John chapter 21, here's Jesus, the resurrected Lord. Jesus shows up on the Sea of Galilee. Here's Peter fishing. Great story. I'm not going to tell the whole story. But Peter comes in, catches fish. Jesus is there grilling fish. Peter comes up by the fire. And Jesus asks him this question. John 21, 15. Peter, do you love me more than these? It's interesting because the word these is not really explained in the text. What is Jesus saying? Peter, do you love me more than what? People have guessed, well, maybe, Peter, do you love me more than these other disciples that are these other fishing buddies that are around you? Do you love me more than these other guys? Others have thought that Jesus is talking about the nets and the boat and the occupation or the hobby of being a fisherman. We're not sure what Jesus says. But he asked Peter, he says, Peter, do you love me more than this? And I think on a regular basis, God wants to know that about my life and yours. Brian, do you love me more than your family? Brian, do you love me more than I got to get this in. The Cleveland Cavaliers. <laughs> Lifelong Cavaliers fan, waited more than 40 years for a championship, all right? Do you love me more than sports? Do you love me more than your hobbies? Do you love me more than the accumulation of wealth? Do you love me more than these? What is the these in your life? You see, if you love anyone or anything more than Jesus, he's not first in your life. Here's our walkaway point today. The walkaway point is this. God desires for us to love him, his kingdom, and his mission more than anyone else or more than anything else. Church, let's not get distracted. This world is not our home. We're tourists. We're passing through. Our home is in heaven. We are citizens of the kingdom of God. And we are moving toward his kingdom. Why would we invest all of our time, talents, and resources in something that we're only going to have for a short period of time. Nobody can serve two masters. You'll either serve the one and love the other, or you'll love the one and hate the other. You cannot serve God and something else at the same time. Where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Where's your heart today? Where's your focus? Let's focus on Jesus. Jesus.